Hi everyone, um, my name is Will. I'm a uh, planning student here at Knowlton. Um, I'd like to quickly thank the Columbus Foundation and the Knowlton School for uh, sponsoring independent student research through travel um, and to introduce my topic of uh, public space in Hong Kong's dense urban environment. Oh, here? Great. I think the, the key thing when I think of Hong Kong, and this is, this is true with most of these Asian megacities, is you really take a look at the density. The density is the critical aspect of these places. And so you look for the systems in this place that have been adapted to this density. So when you've got um, more than 300,000 people maximum in a square mile, how do these systems adapt? So you take things like construction and you see unique, unique adaptations um, for the workforce there. Things like service stations and certain land uses have to be adapted to hillside locations. Public space is changed and reconfigured into places you wouldn't ordinarily see it. And public transportation especially has to receive new adaptations to this place. I think transit is one of the most interesting parts of this density question. So in Hong Kong, you have the Mass Transit Railway, the MTR, which sees a 99% on-time rate, clean stations, clean platforms, a 50 cent US dollar starting fare, and lots of other incredible amenities to boot for this amazing system. It's a great system from any perspective. What's, what really struck me is that it's economically successful. It's one of the only public transportation systems in the world that is profitable. And this is very unusual. Manhattan, New York, Los Angeles, London are not profitable transit systems, but Hong Kong is. I was, I was wondering why that is. When you have a 186% fare box return ratio, which is unheard of, that means that they're doing something correctly. So they, they do something more than transit. They are a land development company in addition to a transit running company. So they have this program called MTR Malls, where they construct large-scale shopping center and apartment complexes on top of their transit stations. This is an example of one in the northeastern part of the city. 
And how they do this is they use a funding system called Rail and Property, where they partner with developers and the government to create unique places on top of transit, which helps with the density question. So the government provides land when MTR commits to building new transit stations. And then they partner with developers to create these new apartment complex blocks on top of the stations. So you, the result is integrated transit-oriented developments all over the city. So it's well, it's well established that this is an economically successful model, but I was more interested in social consequences of this model. So I was looking at public space in Hong Kong's transit land value capture developments. I took a look at three sites, um, varying in size, but all very close to the city center in some of the densest areas of the city. The first being the Interna International Financial Center rooftop plaza, which was opened in 2008, sits walking distance from Victoria Harbor and ferry service to all areas of Hong Kong. It's constructed above a three-floor shopping mall, which is above a transit platform, as well as food uh, stalls and vending areas. Above it sits two large uh, shopping, housing, uh, hotel, and business complex uh, centers. Union Square, which was constructed slightly earlier in 2001, a massive podium development with similar amenities to IFC. It has a mega tower um, that sits as the second tallest tower in Hong Kong, serving as a gateway to the city as well. And the last plaza I took a look at was Telford Plaza, an older development from the early 90s that sits in a two-acre uh, plot in the northeastern section of the city. Similarly, part of a three-phase shopping center development by MTR as well. So the question to me was how to measure these places. How do you measure intangible and tangible elements of public space? Because after all, there are intangible elements to public space that are just as important as statistical evidence of their success. So there's this amazing organization called the Project for Public Spaces, which has done projects in over 100 countries, 8,000 projects, and has a criteria system for rating the quality of public space in urban environments, regardless of where they are. They have four tiers, um, very quickly sociability, um, uses and activities, access and linkages, and comfort and image. Somewhat self-explanatory, but I want to focus on sociability. A good public space supports social interaction. This is a really difficult thing to measure, really complicated, but what you have to do is really sit and observe and try to see where or where not these places are failing or not failing in this respect. So this was a general rating that I um, created from visits, site visits to these places over three different times, AM, PM rush hour, and on a, a weekend-use scenario. And I was very surprised to see that these places did very well, according to this, rank, this ranking and criteria system. I didn't expect to see this. You have an economically successful model that has developed these places, and it is also socially acceptable, socially uh, uh, profitable and works very well. I did not expect that and was surprised to see that, especially, most surprisingly, in the oldest development, Telford Plaza. And what was interesting is that in sociability, it ranked the highest. The oldest place ranked the highest, which to me meant that, being, that having an older place gives it um, a foundation in the community. Because when you see situations like this, I'm sorry, excuse me. When you see a place that's built over a 25-track rail yard, which it is, and then you have examples of situations like this where a police officer is providing directions to the general public, engaging with the community, and helping them understand where they are, that means you found a place that is successful. And I think a model that is successful for Hong Kong and expansion in, in the global environment. So just to wrap up, you know, I didn't expect to find places in Hong Kong that performed well on this ranking system and was even surprised that they were a part of this funding system. But you know, given the strengths that this place has, I, I would definitely put public space as one of the systems that's been very well adapted to the density constraint of Hong Kong. Thanks so much and I look forward to continuing our conversation over lunch.